Welcome to Security Token Insight, brought to you by the Security Token Academy. The security token industry is here and will provide a key foundation for the evolving financial internet. The Security Token Academy provides insights about this new era for security token enthusiasts, investors, and issuers. The security token industry is here and you can get involved. Hi, I'm Adam Chapnick. And I'm Amy Wan. Thanks for joining us. Coming up on today's episode of Security Token Insight. In your Security Token Investing News, details on Prime Trust's new strategic partnership. Plus, we'll speak with securities attorney Mark Boyron for the latest updates from the Security and Exchange Commission. We have highlights from the inaugural commercial real estate case study on the tokenization of the St. Regis Aspen Resort. That and much more is coming up on this episode of Security Token Insight. Now it's time for your Security Token Investing News. Security token trading platform T0 has distributed its security token to investors. T0, a portfolio company of Overstock.com, concluded their $134 million offering in August. Investors now have the option to either hold their tokens in a personal wallet or they can opt to create a brokerage account with T0's partner, Dinosaur Financial Group, with the first option requiring a two-step verification process. T0 is a gold corporate member of the Security Token Academy. To learn more, visit our website and click on the Directory tab and the Corporate Member homepage. Our second story focuses on SharesPost, which is a leading provider of liquidity to the private growth asset class. SharesPost announced that their initial digital security token sale will be conducted by CityBlock Capital on the SharesPost platform. CityBlock also announced that it has chosen the SharesPost platform to provide secondary liquidity for its tokens. CityBlock's digital tokens will represent ownership interests in CityBlock's NYCQ blockchain infrastructure fund. The fund is a venture capital fund which focuses solely on investing in companies building blockchain-based capital markets infrastructure. CityBlock plans to invest 90% of its capital in early stage firms, while the other 10% will be invested in late stage companies. Rob Nance, co-founder and managing partner of CityBlock Capital, told us, quote, SharesPost is the industry leader in secondary market liquidity for privately held companies. Building on that experience, they've created a robust infrastructure to facilitate both primary issuance and secondary market trading of tokenized securities. We are excited to partner with SharesPost to provide the investors of NYCQ an unparalleled user experience throughout the life cycle of the token, end quote. And finally, Cripital Group has announced a new strategic partnership with Prime Trust. The two companies aim to utilize each other's services. Cripital Group currently provides the ability to create and issue tokens, while Prime Trust provides custody solutions for digital assets, along with compliance services and fund processing. Prime Trust CEO Scott Purcell says the collaboration will continue to reduce market friction worldwide. Prime Trust is a gold corporate member of the Security Token Academy. To learn more, visit our website and click on the Directory tab and the Corporate Member homepage. The Security Token Academy held its fourth meetup here in Southern California on January 31st. It took place inside Maggiano's at the Grove in Los Angeles. We had a packed house as security token enthusiasts from all over converged at the meetup. There was free food, drinks, networking, and more. I had the chance to catch up with Mark Boyron. Mark is a securities attorney and partner at Fisher Broyles. We discussed the latest rulings from the Securities and Exchange Commission and more in this expert interview. Take a look. The first thing let's talk about is news about offshore developments. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, so one of the things that everybody's going to remember is that offshore offerings were like the hot thing, especially once the SEC started cracking on things. The, the thought was, let's just sell our securities offshore and then we're going to be free. Um, and while there's tons of issues under reg S and that kind of stuff, one of the key questions that people didn't talk about a lot was, does the SEC even have jurisdiction to go after those? And that always was two questions. One is, from a legal perspective, do they have jurisdiction? The other one's, practically speaking, can they go do it? I think practically speaking, they've already proven that they can with one broker when they seized the domain name with the FBI. So then the question is, from a legal perspective, could they? And the background to that actually goes back a few years. Um, the question was always, there was legislation in the Dodd-Frank Act that actually addressed the fact that the SEC had very, very broad rights to actually go after um, uh, uh, you know, anyone making a securities offering offshore. Um, the Dodd-Frank Act essentially addressed that, but it was done at the same time as a Supreme Court offering, literally a month apart. 
wording in the legislation is very strange. It was never clear whether um, they actually meant to address it and limit the SEC's jurisdiction or not. Um, and essentially what we ended up seeing is uh, about a couple years ago there was a case um, where a district court essentially decided that sure the legislation didn't directly address it, but the legislation legislator meant to address it. And now we've had an appeals court uh, just uh, a, a couple days ago or a couple weeks ago um, that have addressed it as well and that basically said yes, the Supreme Court was actually trying to go ahead and give the SEC uh, some limitations on the SEC, I mean some expansion of the SEC's jurisdiction. So what does this mean for issuers? Bottom line, if you did an offshore offering and you thought the SEC wouldn't have jurisdiction, it's not necessarily going to be the case. And what is the basis for that, um, that uh, line of thought? Really, it's a question of if this issuer didn't really have anything to do with the U.S. or its effect of what it did in the U.S. wasn't really substantial in any way, then why should the SEC have jurisdiction? Very interesting. So the other big uh, piece of news this week is that Kick came out and basically made a, a row in the community about the fact that they are fighting the SEC. And in December, they submitted a Wells submission, and now they're out in public talking about... Um, you know, their exact uh, line of reasoning and argumentation about why they're not a security. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. So this is what the crypto community has been waiting for. A company that was capitalized with somewhere in like 92, 93 million dollars in an ICO um, that is essentially saying we're not just going to take what the SEC tells us and settle with them, we're going to go fight this. Um, and so the SEC sent them what's referred to as a Wells notice that said, hey, we're going to give you a chance to explain to us why we shouldn't bring an enforcement action against you. And so in December, two big law firms submitted that to the SEC. Uh, and then, as you said, the CEO decided to come out and say, all right, here you go, let's make it public. We're going to show you what we submitted because we're ready to fight whether the SEC decides to take this us, us up on this or not. And there's arguments come down to three things. Number one, KIN, which is their token, is a currency, not a security. Now, the interesting thing about that, people always say a currency excluded from the definition of a security. Well, that exclusion is actually in the Securities Exchange Act, not in the Securities Act of 1933. And so the argument would be, well, they excluded it from the Exchange Act. They never said anything about it in the 93, in the, in the uh, 33 Act, so they meant to exclude it from there as well, or it should be treated as excluded. Um, bottom line, if you look at through kind of federal law, how currency is defined, it's usually limited to kind of fiat currencies backed by some kind of government. It's not some currency that two people decide to invent and call a currency. Um, I don't think that argument is like a, a, you know, it's shot down easily, but I, I'm not sure it's going to necessarily go very far. Then the next one is the argument that you would have expected. This was not an investment contract whatsoever. Um, and the argument is Kick, which is essentially a messenger app. Um, had a kind of pretty robust community that had a point system before they ever even did an ICO. The problem was this point system was pretty limited in the way that it worked. And so the idea was if we can have a kind of more free-flowing cryptocurrency, it's going to help build a more robust community. Uh, and so they went ahead and did an ICO. They used a SAFT and then did a public sale afterwards. Um, the real question is going to be on that, two things. One. When you dig into the communications that they had with private issuers, what did they say? Pantera Capital invested. When they spoke to Pantera, or emailed Pantera, or sent text messages to people at Pantera, what did they say? The second thing is, and that goes to kind of the expectation of profit prong of right. the Howey test. Then the question is, if you have the efforts of others prong, maybe the question is, well, were they sufficiently decentralized under the Hinman test, which was often mentioned in the Wells submission? Um, were they sufficiently decentralized? Well, there's a problem there. One is, were they sufficiently decentralized at the time of their ICO? versus are they sufficiently decentralized now? now? Yes. Which now, they have a pretty robust ecosystem with 30 kind of apps, my understanding, is built on top of it. I don't know what their ecosystem was back then, but that's a big question. Their last argument was kind of amusing, but one that everybody was relying on at the time was, let's assume you don't agree with us that it's a currency. Let's assume that we sold an investment contract. Just take it easy on us, because we did it better than the others. That was is literally that, is that really that was, it? That was oh literally the argument. <laughs> How do you think the SEC is going to react to that one? You know, 
it's what they've done so far. N not necessarily that thought. I mean, they took it easy on Paragon. They took it on easy on Aerofox. For something like Kick, I think they would have taken it on it easy. Now that they've gone and publicly said, yeah. we will defy you, um, I don't sure. think it's going to be that easy. Now, the question is whether it would be wise for the SEC to actually take this up. So what's going to happen is the SEC commissioners are going to vote on whether they actually bring an enforcement action. That could be an administrative proceeding or a court filing. You know, some, look, realistically, this will be a close call. A court filing's a little risky for them, right? They lose that, it doesn't look so good. So if they're gonna do something, it's probably gonna be some kind of administrative proceeding, which still might not look good if they if they lose, but it's gonna be quieter at least. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much for giving us the updates on the state of SEC and token law today. Always glad to do it. To view the full interview with Mark, go to our website, securitytokenacademy.com, and click on the Interviews tab. In a first-of-its-kind multi-city webinar on tokenization of commercial real estate, CREST, a project of the Security Token Academy, provided a detailed case study on the tokenization of the St. Regis Aspen Resort. Learn how the webinar explored the disruptive forces that are emerging in commercial real estate, or CRE, financing. Here are some of the highlights. There's a new type of disruption emerging in the area of CRE financing. It's a way to raise money via a new solution which is compliant with US SEC regulations. It's called tokenization, and it is based on security tokens. What we see today is we're always searching for new buyers out there. I mean, we can only trade back and forth to the same private equity groups that own hotels, buy and sell with each other so many times. The biggest challenge for us is trying to, you know, open up new frontiers of capital out there. The idea that, you know, a traditional hotel owner, how are they going to react to new capital coming in? The ability to monetize their position, either a minority or majority position. I think the more investors we have, the more buyers we have, the more liquidity we have. Uh, I think that only drives the uh, transactions market even further. At the end of the day, you would sell a hotel asset and you can either own that asset for a long period of time or you sell that asset. The biggest and hardest thing in, in what we see in our business is how does an owner take advantage of monetizing perhaps a minority interest in the asset, taking some of their chips off the table and delevering their asset from an equity risk perspective. And so the opportunity to go out there and try and sell a half an asset or a quarter of an asset, the market doesn't really exist for that. So it's pretty much a black and white situation. And so what's interesting about the tokenization model and what we'll be discussing today is how do you, how do you recreate the idea of investing in real estate without it being so black and white? How do you open up the investor universe, not just to private equity, to public REITs, to high net worth individuals, but can you open up in, in investing in real estate, in hotels in particular, to, to other uh, groups with money? Can it be an individual investor that can invest in real estate and say, I own a piece of an asset? This is a gorgeous property. Can you tell me a bit about it? I'd love to. We have 179 guest rooms, 30 suites. This is a, one of our three specialty suites. And then we also have 25 residences, two and three bedrooms, which are fractional ownership house. Fantastic. We did a private placement. Uh, the technical name for the private placement is a Reg D 506C. So once you actually uh, look at what it means, it means that it's a private placement to accredited investors. So you need to be a professional investor in order to enjoy the participation. We wanted to have a diversification of type of investor. So we have some professional ones, some real estate ones, some high net worth. And we also wanted a diversification from a geographical point of view, because to make a market, you need to have different people with different view on one particular product. I think it was different. And I think whenever something is different, it requires a, a real pioneer to get the first transaction through to completion. I mean, in the past, there have been some large examples. Rockefeller Center at one point was, was an example of a, of a single asset REIT, but they've been very rare up to this point, and it's been difficult to convince institutional investors to come into this asset class. One of the other, I think one of the other issues is, I think that there's a feeling of safety with diversity. I think the modern REIT 
phenomenon that began probably with the Kimco transaction in the early 1990s. There was a thought about safety and conservatism was introduced into the REIT marketplace. We could imagine the tokenization process as a regular securities offering, and in fact, a highly efficient way to conduct a securities offering. But we also felt and discussed with the management team at Elevated Returns, you know, the need to conduct the, the tokenization process in compliance with federal and state securities laws. The same technology that allowed us to create these tokens with ERC-20, well, we should be able to add additional software on top of that that can make them automatically comply with those securities regulations. And that allowed us to jump into the third wave, which we're in right now, of security tokens. And these are fully compliant. And they're typically issued under uh, a crowdfunding exemption of some sort. Uh, as Stefan said earlier, uh, they used Reg D, and that tends to be the most popular uh, exemption that people are using. The beauty with a security token, it exists on what we call a cap table, or if you want a shareholders list. So if someone was to steal token, we would know that the current owner of the token is not supposed to own it, and you can actually move the token back to the original owner, so it's actually super safe. The other layer for the audit was what we call functionality. And that is basically a third party testing, back testing the, the contract itself to make sure that the contract is doing what the contract is supposed to do. So if you want to liquidate your token, they can find a buyer for you and they can do it uh, rather immediately. Uh, and so that is primarily what most of the security token exchanges that people are talking about now are using in order to build an exchange to trade security tokens. However, uh, T0 actually recently joined up with Box Digital to create a JV to pursue a national securities exchange mm. to trade security tokens. So yeah, this is really one of the, the sort of holy grails of this whole conversation is that the key benefit of this security token world is this liquidity that may happen someday, but without these guys kind of draw, drumming it up, right. it's that, that benefit is, is not there. Absolutely. So we need them. Wave three is the security tokens. It's the regulated space. It's where investors can go and know that they are uh, protected by all the investor regulations that the SEC has been enforcing for you know almost a century. Right. Uh, and, and that's what, what we're really focused on here. So we're really talking about three types of exchanges. It's the traditional stock exchanges, uh, we've got the new cryptocurrency exchanges, and then now these burgeoning, these coming security token exchanges. Yeah, and we might start seeing the lines get blurred, actually, between the traditional stock exchanges and the security token exchanges, especially because you have uh, big market players like NASDAQ, mm -hmm. who has basically said that they are totally committed to this blockchain security token ecosystem. To watch the full webinar, just go to Crest.io to register. Registration is free. Back in October, the Security Token Academy held events around the nation to signal the kickoff of the security token industry. We held security token meetups in Los Angeles and also in New York City. Attendees who purchased tickets to our two-day cruise and conference in New York boarded the Spirit of New York yacht from Chelsea Harbor for an evening cruise along the Hudson River. That was followed by the security token industry launch event inside the Conrad, New York. Hundreds of people were in attendance as industry leaders rang the opening bell to signal the official kickoff to the security token industry. To view all of the videos from Security Token Industry Launch Week, go to our website, securitytokenacademy.com, and click on the Events tab and select Launch Event Video Library. The best part, it's free and contains a wealth of information. All right, that's it for today's show. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, and Medium. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page so you don't miss out on any of our videos and expert interviews. I'm Amy Wan. And I'm Adam Chapnick. But before we go, a big thank you to our Platinum Corporate member, Merrill Lynch, and all of our Gold Corporate members as well. We invite you to learn more about our corporate members by clicking on the directory page on our website. For everyone here at Security Token Academy, thanks for watching.
The Security Token Academy is dedicated to covering and facilitating the evolution of the emerging security token industry. From interviews with leading experts to highlights from security token events around the world, be sure to visit our website, securitytokenacademy.com, today to learn more.